before I start speaking, I'd like to just say that I've been very motivated by the meeting that we've had so far. And this is my first Labor Day meeting, and I've really enjoyed it. It's been a great blessing to me. And to spend time with those of like precious faith has been uplifting to me. And another Kentucky boy showed up about 1230, Colonel Sanders, <laughs> along with his 11 herbs and spices. And for that, we can all be thankful. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to continue in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. He's getting about halfway through his letter here in verse 28 where he says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. In this fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, he is explaining how these Christians should turn away from their old way of life by renewing their mind. In verses 25 through 32, Paul provides specific examples of sins that have carried over from some of these Christians' old way of life into their new life in Christ. But not only does Paul point these things out to these Christians, he speaks against and he speaks against them, but he provides the remedy. He tells them how to fix it. He doesn't just tell them what they've done wrong. He tells them how to correct themselves. If you went to a doctor and you told the doctor everything that was wrong with you, you told him problems that you were having, uh, things that were causing you discomfort. Then he went and he did some tests. He maybe did some blood work, sent off to a lab, maybe did some x-rays, maybe a CAT scan. He comes back in and he tells you what's wrong, but then he leaves the room. He tells you what happened and what's wrong with you, but he doesn't tell you how to fix it. He doesn't write you a prescription. He doesn't provide you with a way to fix your problem. That wouldn't be very beneficial at all. That wouldn't help us in any way. That's not what the doctor is for. Of course the doctor is there to tell us what's wrong with us, but also to provide the remedy. And that's what Paul is doing here. It says in verse 28, there at the beginning, let him that stole steal no more. The fact that Paul included this implies that some of them had been guilty of stealing either before or after their conversion. But what does it mean to steal? And I know we all have a picture in our mind of what it is to steal and what it means to steal. For most of us, the thing that we think of is maybe somebody creeping through the night uh, trying to steal something that isn't theirs. Uh, maybe we hear that word steal and we think of somebody in all black in a ski mask maybe trying to break into a house, go through a window, or maybe break into a service station or something along those lines. Uh, we might have that picture in our mind. But the definition of stealing certainly covers that scenario. And that certainly would be a good example of stealing. But God's idea of stealing covers much more than that. Stealing is obtaining something from another person by dishonest, unfair, and taking advantage of other people. By being dishonest, unfair, and taking advantage. But what does that entail? What actions does that include, being dishonest, or being unfair, or taking advantage of somebody else? Well, have you ever sold something to somebody and didn't tell them everything about it? Maybe you had a vehicle and you were selling this vehicle to someone and it had a mechanical issue of some kind, but it, rather than telling that person before you sold it to them about that issue, you sold it to them and they were unaware. Well, that would be stealing. Have you ever sold something to somebody and charged them more than what it was worth? Uh, if you do that, then that's stealing as well. If I was to sell my car, I would just have to give it away because it's not worth hardly anything. But have you ever been given a job? And there's a certain job description, there are certain duties that you are responsible for, but you haven't completely fulfilled those duties. And you take the same amount of money, you take the same amount of pay, and you've done less than what you were asked to do, or less than what you were required to do, or you haven't completed the entire job. Well, that would be stealing as well. And all these actions are very common in our society today. TV shows and movies and books, they portray these people, these thieves, these dishonest people, these individuals that take advantage of others, they portray these people as heroes or as clever or as smart individuals. And these are becoming the role models of our society. We have to be careful about what we watch on television and what books we read and what we watch on, so on social media because these dishonest people and these thieves are becoming role models in our society. But Paul has pointed out in verse 28, to let them him that stole steal no more. Stealing is wrong. And that might sound like an easy enough thing for us to understand. It may sound like a very easy command for us to follow. If we've always been honest, if we've always been truthful and honest in all of our dealings and all of our jobs, uh, if we have been honest in our business practices and our work, 
And for those of us that have never stolen anything before, this sounds like a very easy command for us to follow. But I think it would be beneficial for us to consider the individual that has made a living by being dishonest or stealing or doing things that are not right. If we consider how hard it would be for that individual to understand that command, somebody that has made a lifestyle out of being dishonest, it's not easy for them to make this change or even for them to understand it. And that's where we come in. And that's where God's Word comes in. If you tell a person that has lived a life of sin, that has uh, been dishonest, that is uh, in their dealings, and their businesses, and they've stolen, if you tell them to stop stealing, they won't know what to do. They won't understand that. It's a habit and it's a way of life. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands. That's what it goes on to say in verse 28. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands. And Paul is saying, if you stole, don't do that anymore. Instead, work with your hands. That's the remedy. Work with your hands. Hard work has a tendency to build good moral character in a man. Hard, honest work makes you appreciate things more as well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 11 through 12, it says, And that ye study to be quiet, and do your own business, to work with your own hands, as we commanded you that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and you may have lack of nothing. A hard-working person is typically an honest person. And I can't think of anyone more honest than a brother in our home congregation at Blue Springs. His name's Arliss McFerrin. And he's been a logger his entire life, and he's a very hard-working person, and probably the most honest person that I've ever met. I know that I could go to Arliss and ask him any question, and he would give me an honest answer. Sometimes he's a little bit too honest. I date his granddaughter, and uh, the first time that I went over to their house for Sunday dinner, he said, you want some buttermilk to drink? And I said, no, Arliss, I don't like buttermilk. He said, you don't like buttermilk? Well, how'd you get so fat? <laughs> and of course, I know that he was joking with me, uh, but he is a very honest man. And he... <laughs> but you see, hard work is the remedy for a dishonest heart. Hard work is the remedy for a dishonest heart. And that's what Paul is telling the Christians here at Ephesus. Verse 28 goes on to say, working with his hands, the thing which is good. So what is that thing which is good? What does Paul mean by that? Well, be sure that you are laboring for what is good, not letting your focus drift from what is of eternal importance. As we work, we should have our minds focused on our eternal, on our eternal destination. And we are to be strangers of the things of the world. Don't let your hard work cultivate a love for money because money can quickly become the master of our lives. And if we allow money to become the master of our lives, then we have taken our focus off of God and put our focus on chasing a dollar. If we live our lives chasing money and we live our lives focused on work and we live our lives focused on our occupation and we're not putting God first, we turn our children to do the same thing. If we seek first the kingdom of God, rather, our children will be trained to do the same thing. If on Sunday morning there's no question in your house that we are going to church this morning, if there's a gospel meeting in your congregation and there's no question, we're going to every meeting that we can every night. If there's a need in the community, if somebody asks for help, there's no question in your household that you're going to do everything that you can to help that individual. If somebody is down on their luck, if there's a widow that needs her yard mowed, there's no question that we are going to help that individual and we're going to help that person. Seek first the kingdom of God and our children will be trained to do the same. And finally, Paul ends this verse by explaining that by working with our hands, we, we do so that we may have whereof to give to him that hath need. A Christian should use his means liberally to help the poor, the widows, and the orphans. And in this way, we'll promote the honor of God. The challenge I submit to you today is to be renewed.